Volume One, Chapter Ten of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume One, Chapter Ten. Early in the evening of the following day, Celestina and her humble friend arrived at the lodging she had taken. It was a small, new-built brick house on the edge of an extensive common. Enclosures at a distance relieved a little the dreary uniformity of the view from its windows, and a village church, with a few straggling houses scattered round the edge of the heath, at the distance of about half a mile, gave some relief to the eye and some intimation of an inhabited country. Winter had alike divested the common of its firs and heath blossoms, and the few elms on its borders of their foliage. All was alike dull and unpleasant, but Celestina remembered that she had now escaped from the castle Norse from the sight of preparations for Willoughby's marriage, and that if she was not to live to see him happy, she should not now witness his struggles and his distress. She tried to believe that she could receive intelligence of his marriage with composure, and be glad in the reflection that he had obeyed his mother, but her heart revolted and all she could promise herself was to exert her resolution to obtain such a state of mind as might enable her to hear without very acute anguish of an event with notwithstanding all that had passed at her last interview with willoughby she still considered as inevitable the first day after her arrival was passed in settling herself in her new habitation by the aid of jessie who helped her arrange her books and her wardrobe the pensive simplicity of her new friend's character won upon her every hour and now deprived as she was of all her former connections and of every prospect of happiness for herself she was sensible of no other pleasure than what arose from the power of soothing the sorrows of her unfortunate companion and forming schemes for restoring her to the favour of her grandfather and to her unhappy lover in whose fate she became as much interested from the artless description jessie had given as she had herself known him it was necessary, however, to part with her, but as she appeared in too weak a state of health to encounter the rude reception she might meet from her father and her mother-in-law, if she appeared before them without notice, Celestina thought it best to keep her till an answer could be obtained from them, and she therefore hired a messenger, by whom the letter, the trembling Jessie, indicted was dispatched to the cottage of woodburn which was about seven miles distant towards evening he returned and brought a reluctant and surely consent from her father to receive her for a little time till she recovered her health the terms in which this answer was written though celestina endeavoured to give them the best interpretation she could were cruelly painful to poor jessie who wept over the letter while celestina with the most generous pity assured her that if her father's behaviour to her was unkind and her stay at his house uncomfortable she would again receive her and that she should be welcomed to re remain with her till her health was re-established and till means could be found to procure for her the favour of her grandfather, who, on inquiry of her hostess, Celestina found to be, as Jessie had represented him, a very rich farmer, now quite superannuated and almost childish, 
who had once determined to resent his daughter's marriage had persisted in it from the hard obstinacy of his nature and had been supported in it by the arts of an old female relation who lived with him and who while she made a purse every year out of what was entrusted to her looked forward with avidity to his death when she hoped to possess the whole celestina procured a horse and a man to lead it the expense of which she paid herself and on the third day after their arrival at thorpe heath jessie took leave of her lovely and generous benefactress who was now left to reflect without interruption on her own destiny till lately she had not been conscious of the force of her attachment to Willoughby, for it began so early in life that she had never been alarmed by the uneasiness which seizes the heart on its first reception of a new passion. She now, however, found that her existence had been delightful to her, only as his idea had mingled itself with every hour of it, that now, when she believed she ought no longer to indulge herself in thinking of him, she could think of nothing else, with either interest or pleasure, the benevolence and tenderness of her heart still afforded her some satisfaction, while she could exert it in favour of the unfortunate, and the power of befriending the desolate and unhappy Jessie had called off her attention a little from her own uneasy feelings, but now, having done all she could at present do for her, her heart was again sensible of the cruel deprivation to which she was condemned, and her mind occupied in reflecting on what Willoughby would think, what he would say when he learned she was gone, in conjectures on his behaviour to the castle norse and in trembling solicitude whether he would write to her or without any farther indulgence of an attachment which he knew he ought not to cherish drive her from his recollection at least till he had obeyed the injunctions of his mother and by completing the marriage she had insisted upon put it out of his power to think of Celestina otherwise than as his sister. Two or three days passed thus before Celestina could acquire any degree her usual serenity, and sit down to her books, her drawing, or her work. By music, which she now fancied would soothe and calm her spirits, she could not amuse herself for though she had a piano forte which used to be hers yet as it had never been formally given to her and as mrs molyneux had never mentioned it celestina would not take it on her quitting london at length the first uneasy sensations on her change of situation a little subsided and she began to consider of a letter which she thought it indispensably necessary to write to mrs molyneux in the meantime the ardent and eager temper of willoughby exhibited in london a scene which should celestina have known it would have redoubled all her anxiety the dinner of which he had been with difficulty induced to partake at lord castlenorth's had served only to fill him with new and invincible disgust towards the whole family and hardly could he command himself so as not to betray it the restraint however which in consideration of their relationship to his mother he determined whatever it cost him to put upon his sentiments gave to two of the persons concerned a favourable impression of him lord castlenorth fond of form and that of reserve which he fancied supported dignity liked his nephew the better he said for not assuming the familiar and too easy manners so disagreeable to him in the behaviour of most of the young men he saw and miss fitzhaman 
who liked his person better on every interview, and who never could for a moment suppose that any man could behold hers with indifference, imputed to respect and admiration that distant politeness which was intended to conceal aversion. Lady Castlenorth, however, who had seen more of the world than her daughter, and had not the same prejudices as her husband, was by no means pleased with the observations she made in the course of the day, nor with the pleasure she saw for the first time in the eyes of Willoughby, when the moment of their departure arrived. This was not till four in the morning. The late hour of dinner, the parties which were made for cards, brought on a supper at near two, of which Lady Castlenorth seemed to expect her guests would partake. They stayed, therefore, Lord Castlenorth retiring early, by the advice of Mrs. Calder, and the universality of Lady Castlenorth's knowledge being displayed the whole time to the extreme fatigue of Willoughby, and by no means to the satisfaction of his sister, who found in her aunt a desire to monopolize not only all the conversation, but the attention of every man present, to whom she contrived to address herself by turns, and with whom she appeared immediately offended if Mrs. Molyneux, whom she considered and treated as a pretty automaton, attracted even for a moment any of that admiration that she was generally at her own parties and among her own friends accustomed to engross willoughby was set down by his sister at his own lodgings and mrs molyneux herself knew nothing of celestina's departure till breakfast the next day when busied with preparations for a ball subscribed for by some nobleman of her acquaintance she listened to the information hardly knowing she received it and testified no other concern than by saying coldly i wish she had stayed till to-morrow for she has really something of a taste and i shouldn't have liked to have had her here when i dress this important dress, however, was too momentous to suffer her to think long of any human being, and when her brother called upon her about three o'clock, she was adjusting the ornaments on a tiara of her own invention, and had forgotten for the moment not only the sudden journey of Celestina, but Celestina herself. Willoughby sat down by her, and in hopes of Celestina's coming in, entered into conversation on frivolous subjects, to which he, in fact, gave so little attention that he hardly heard the answers his sister gave him. He desired, however, to prolong the time of his stay as much as possible, that without asking for Celestina he might see her, and he knew that busied as Mrs. Molyneux was, he should have an opportunity of speaking to her without observation. The tiara was at length ornamented, and no Celestina appeared. Willoughby then inquired why she did not assist at an operation so important, and heard with pain and amazement that she had left the house at five o'clock that morning. "'And whither is she gone?' said he in a voice hardly audible and how could you suffer her go oh as to that answered mrs molyneux quite regardless of his distress she has taken those lodgings you know in devonshire that you have so often heard her speak of and for her going you know she has long determined on it and indeed i did not oppose it thinking as things are it was the very best resolution she could take. "'As things are?' repeated Willoughby, trying vainly to stifle the painful sensation his sister's coldness and insensibility gave him. "'I know not, Mrs. Molyneux, what you mean exactly, but—' He was proceeding when the hairdresser, 
who on these great occasions was employed in preference to her own maid, was announced, and Mrs. Molyneux, ordering him into her powdering room, walked immediately away, and left Willoughby sitting like a statue by the dressing-table she had left. He remained there near a quarter of an hour, in a state of mind difficult to be described. The danger to which Celestina must be exposed, alone and unprotected, the probability of his losing her for ever, nay, of her sacrificing herself to some of those pretenders whom he doubted not her beauty would attract, in the same spirit of disinterested heroism as that which had determined her to quit London, the excessive tenderness he was conscious of towards her, against which he found every hour the impossibility of contending, and the increasing disgust that he felt in contemplating the chains he had promised to put on, all contributed to overwhelm his mind with anguish from which he saw not how it was easy or even possible to escape. His first idea was to obtain a direction to Celestina and follow her immediately, but he knew the delicacy of her mind, and he felt perfectly what was due to her situation, reflections which checked those intentions almost as soon as they were formed, and before he could decide on what he ought to do, he received from Molyneux, who had just come in and gone out again, an unsealed note containing these lines. Dear George, I am just returned from Lincoln's Inn, where I have been to meet Atkins and some other cursed bores about money. I cannot get what I want from them. Do contrive to let me have five hundred this evening for my pocket, and I wish you would arrange things so as to have the remainder of the unpaid five thousand and interest ready by this day, said night, or it will much inconvenient me. Castle North is your man, and it is but speaking for the money to have it. Let us see you to-morrow to dinner. Yours ever, P. H. Molyneux. This note, so peremptory, requiring what the writer knew Willoughby could not obtain, but, by hastily confirming those measures which were so displeasing to him, this unfeeling precipitation, which appeared only a finesse to compel him to plunge into them, roused Willoughby from the state of undetermined anxiety he had been in, into anger and indignation. His first solicitude, however, was to raise instantly the five hundred pounds for that evening's play, which was clearly the meaning of his brother-in-law, and snatching up his hat he left the house, determining in his first emotions of his resentment to enter it no more. He took his way towards the city, and applying to a banker in Lombard Street, in whose hands his father had kept his money, and who had had considerable advantages by his own affairs during his minority, he obtained, not without solicitation, the most painful to his pride, and on terms as hard as would have been demanded by a common money-lender the sum he wanted, which he enclosed in a cover, and sent by one of the clerks, with these words. Mr. Willoughby encloses to Mr. Molyneux the sum for which he has so pressing an occasion, and assures him he will lose no time in procuring the rest, that all pecuniary transactions may be at an end between them. It was with great difficulty he bridled the natural vehemence of his temper, and forbore to express with bitterness this displeasure Molyneux proceeding had given him, more resolute than ever not to be dictated to by his brother-in-law, and detesting more than before the marriage which was thus intended to be forced upon him, dissatisfied with every idea that occurred to him, 
having no friend in London to whom he could open his expressed heart, he determined at length to procure a direction to Celestina, and returning immediately to Cambridge himself, consult a friend he had there, on whose judgment and attachment he had an equal reliance, how he should avoid an alliance with the woman he detested, and the hazard he now incurred of losing the woman he adored. He sent, therefore, a servant, as soon as he returned to his lodgings, to procure from the servants of Molyneux a copy of the direction that had been put on the trunks sent to Celestina. This being obtained, he ordered a post-chaise, and late as it was, and without giving any account of himself either to his sister or the castle Norse, he set out for Cambridge, and arrived at his college about four in the morning of the next day. End of Volume 1, Chapter 10 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 1, Chapter 11 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 1, Chapter 11. Celestina, in the meantime, became better reconciled to the plan of life she had adopted, and after being near a week at her new abode, during which time she heard nothing either of Willoughby or his sister, she wrote to the latter as follows. My dear Mrs. Molyneux will be glad to hear that her wandering friend is settled contently, if not happily in her new abode, and has already subdued her mind to her fortune so much as to regret only the society of those she has been so long accustomed to love, and by no means the scenes in which she has left them. My habitation is the house of a man who was formerly master of a coasting vessel, in which occupation having made money enough to support himself and his wife in their old age, and all his children being married and provided for, he built this house a few miles from the port where he used to trade. Their only servant is a mere West Country Perian, who does the business which the good old woman herself is unequal to, whose not frequent but somewhat loud and shrill recompenses to Jenny, when she is careless or neglectful, are the only sounds I ever hear to remind me that there are such things as anger or contention in the world. The scene around me is now dreary enough, but in a few weeks spring will produce new pleasures for me, and I shall hail the first primrose with as much delight as I can feel from anything, but from that most welcome sight, the face of an old friend, my dear Matilda, you pity. I know the merely negative life I have chosen, enliven it then sometimes by your kind recollection, and find time now and then to write me, if it be only to say you are well. Your brother's marriage may at this period occupy you, yet I hope you will not even now forget me, nor fail to recollect the tender interest which must ever exist for your happiness, and that all of you love in the grateful heart of your affectionate Celestina de Mornay, February seventh, 1700. This letter arrived a day after Willoughby's abrupt departure. Between the continual and unceasing hurry in which she lived, and her vexation at that event she hardly read it but threw it carelessly by on her toilet where it remained forgotten like the writer of it on the day willoughby had dined and supped in grosvenor street the whole family 
had been much dissatisfied with his conduct except his uncle who retaining much of form and ceremony in his own manners was willing to impute his coldness to respect and his distant civility to veneration but the mother and daughter were by no means content with his deportment and though they concealed their feelings as it were by mutual consent their pride was equally alarmed and both resolved to have an early explanation lady castlenorth however whose policy only had power to restrain a while the ebullitions of her wounded pride waited one day in hopes that willoughby would in a family conference testify more ardour for the match than he had done in mixed company but willoughby never appeared and her indignation now knowing no bounds she ordered her coach and on the next stalked with more than usual majesty into the dressing-room of mrs molyneux just as she had finished her breakfast which was owing to the hour on which she went to bed the preceding morning even later than usual lady castlenorth hardly spoke to mrs molyneux when she entered but demanded in imperious tone what was become of mr willoughby the lady to whom she thus abruptly addressed herself was as haughty and of as high consequence in her own estimation as lady castlenorth herself and feeling and resenting her rude and peremptory style she answered with almost as little compliance in her manner that she knew not you don't know madame exclaimed the imperious vicomtesse you don't know very extraordinary surely what am i to understand from all of this of that also i am ignorant replied mrs molyneux mr willoughby madame is his own master and i really cannot more account for than direct his actions astonishing reassumed lady castlenorth that a man situated as he is who is not an absolute idiot should he have in this manner in an affair on which his very existence as a man of fashion depends but don't imagine mistress mono that my daughter dear madame interrupted matilda irritated by the supercilious insolent tone in which her ladyship spoke and particularly the emphasis she put on the word mistress i beg and entreat that you will spare your anger i at least cannot deserve it for i have no influence over my brother i dare say he has some reasons for having left london so abruptly though i assure you i do not know them you don't i do he has gone after that creature whom your mother to her utter disgrace brought up in the family and with whom she suffered her son to live in habits of intimacy which shock me every time i think of it at this moment mr molyneux entered with a letter in his hand and hardly in his haste noticing lady castlenorth he told his wife that the letter was that instant delivered to him by an express that his father was dying and they must immediately set out for ireland at his earnest entreaty hasten therefore said he to prepare yourself for the chaise i have sent for will be at the door in a moment your ladyship will excuse us i am sure on such an occasion added he addressing himself to lady castlenorth matilda we have not a moment to lose direct your maid to prepare what you want to take with you and follow herself with the baggage that may not be so immediately necessary and where is willoughby cried lady castlenorth raising her voice i insist upon seeing him i believe he has left london answered molyneux but i assure you i know not whither he is gone i dare say your ladyship will soon hear of him in the meantime 
pray pardon me it is impossible for me now to have the honor of attending you he then left the room as his wife had done already and lady castlenorth bursting with anger and indignation which she had nobody to listen to returned in all the fury of mortified pride to her own house while she was there meditating how to revenge the neglect shrewd to her daughter of which she was no longer doubted willoughby was pouring out all the distresses of his heart to a friend whom heaven seemed to have sent him for their alleviation mr vazor his most intimate friend had been absent when he left cambridge on his hasty and reluctant journey to london but was now returned and to him willoughby immediately disclosed the cause of that uneasiness which his friend perceived he suffered under even before he spoke what shall i do said he as he leaned on the table how extradite myself from the most unsupportable of engagements how satisfy the narrow and unfeeling molyneux my soul revolts from the odious necessity of being obliged to him for forbearance yet to sell my estates is more painful to me than my any measure but marrying miss fitzhaman yet my promise my assurances to my mother i see not how i can escape from the difficulties that encompass me you make more of them surely my dear george replied vasover than is necessary what should either a promise or an exigence compel you to be miserable for life then indeed there would be no escape but now surely my friend your escape is not difficult were you situated as i am then how would you act why i would without hesitation declare off with the woman i did not like and marry the woman i did that is if i were disposed to marry at all and would you do this vasover contrary to solemn promise given to her who cannot now release me from it and then how can i act in regard to molyneux be the consequence what it will he shall never again dun me for money and never interrupted vasover warmly if you will listen to me i am not quite of age it is true but my fortune is such that nothing is easier than for me to raise this paltry five thousand pounds or twice the sum on no very exorbitant terms i have already taken up money for my own pleasures and shall i hesitate when my friend has real occasion for it in a week's time the money shall be ready for you pray then let us hear no more of any difficulties of that sort and as for your promise the good lady when she extorted it could never think it binding speak not lightly of her my dear friend cried willoughby that i may feel all the kindness of the former part of your speech without alloy she was a woman whom had you known you would have reverenced and loved and it was in kindness only that she made me give her an engagement to make yourself miserable i am you know george an epicurean you are somewhat of a stoic i suppose and if that is the case fulfil your promise take your harris and philosophize at your leisure i have never seen your celestina you know but from your description of her and your long attachment i should pity you i am afraid i should despise you i am sure i should not love you were you to sacrifice such a creature to any pecuniary considerations come my dear fellow assure yourself that if five thousand pounds or more will relieve you from what weighs on your spirits about molyneux's matter it is yours the other affair you must settle with your own heart and i leave you to argue it together vasover 
then quitted the room and willoughby released from his anxiety about his debt by the generosity of his friend gave himself up to all those pleasant images which presented themselves to his mind to be united immediately with celestina to carry her down to alvanstone and there to enter on a plan of economy which should in a very few years retrieve his circumstances was a vision which he found so much delight in cherishing that he drove from his mind as much as possible the painful objections that still cruelly intruded themselves to destroy it the conversation of vassivore helped to put them entirely to flight and willoughby persuaded that by the projects of economy he had formed he should soon be enabled to pay his friend the money so generously offered him agreed without much hesitation to accept it the young men then settled that they would go the next day but one to london stay there long enough to negotiate this business and then go down together to elvenstone from whence willoughby who had no inclination to encounter lady castlenorth personally determined to write to his uncle resigning all pretensions to the honour intended him and immediately to complete his marriage with her who had so long been mistress of his heart this arrangement once made became every moment more seducing to his imagination still the words of his mother the solemn charge given him with her last breath returned now and then to disturb his visionary felicity but celestina always so lovely in his eyes leaning on his arm amid the shades of alvanstone the delight of all who beheld her the admiration of his friends the patroness of his tenants the protection of the poor was an image so deliciously soothing to his fancy that by indulging it he at length persuaded himself that his mother who had so very tenderly loved her would could she be sensible of all the happiness they should share together applaud his violation of his promise and sanction his choice Vazivur, gay generous open-hearted and volatile always eagerly following himself his own inclinations and warmly solicitous for his friend's gratification as his own encouraged as much as possible all tendency in willoughby to throw off any adherence to what he deemed tyranny beyond the grave and by the time the negotiation for the loan was completed which took them up near a week willoughby had no longer any scruples remaining his only business in town then was to pay molyneux whose conduct had offended him so much that he had not been to the house as soon however as the money was ready he wrote a note to his brother-in-law signifying that he would on the next day meet him at his attorney's chambers to settle all accounts between them the servant who was sent brought the note back and willoughby then first learning that his sister and her husband were embarked for ireland deposited the money at a banker's and wrote a cold letter to mono signifying that he waited his orders he then gave directions to his own solicitor to take proper receipts on the payment of it and with vassifer hastened down to elvenstone in the neighbourhood of which place he knew celestina was but he had determined not to see her till he had obviated every objection she could make to his plan of happiness by breaking at once and for ever with the castle norse a task on which resolved as he was to execute it he could not think without a mixture of concern and apprehension that he was ashamed of feeling and dared by no means betray to his friend vassifer who without knowing anything of the castle norse himself had made up his mind that they were an odious and disagreeable set and from such 
whatever might be their rank, he always flew away himself, and encouraged his friends to do it at whatever risk. If he was careless and even rude towards those whom he did not wish to please, he was altogether as amiable and attentive to those to whom he sought to be acceptable. His dislikes and his attachments were equally warm, and the latter had hitherto been rather warm than permanent. End of Volume 1, Chapter 11 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 1, Chapter 12 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume 1, Chapter 12. While these things were passing at Cambridge and in London, Celestina underwent the cruelest anxiety at not hearing from Mrs. Melano, but all her conjunctures ended in the painful conclusion that the preparations and celebration of Willoughby's marriage entirely engaged her and prevented her writing. All her reason was now summoned to support her against the shock which the certainty of this event would give her. With a beating heart and in breathless agitation, she ran over the paper which once a week a travelling newsman brought in from Exeter, and where she knew the marriage of a man of so much consequence in the neighbourhood would not fail to be inserted. No such intelligence, however, appeared, and Celestina, imagining that the marriage had notwithstanding certainly taken place, endeavoured, since she could not conquer her regret, to divert it, by trying what she could to do towards softening the sorrows and relieving the distresses of the unfortunate Jessie, whose patient endurance of evils evidently severer than her own, whose fortitude in tearing herself perhaps for ever from the man she loved, and sacrificing the indulgence of her affliction to her interest, made Celestina sometimes ashamed of the murmurs she found excited in her heart by less inconveniences, and blush at the reluctance with which she had submitted to the loss of a man whose regard for her seemed already to have yielded to the influence of a pecuniary advantage and family convenience. But in despite of every argument she could bring to subdue the pain arising from the recollection of lost happiness, and totally silence from the siren voice of hope which, now and then presided the possibility of more favourable days, the uncertainty whether the event to which she laboured to become reconciled had really happened, disturbed and rendered her restless and uneasy. Jessie, to whom she now sent to desire her company for a little time, joyfully accepted the summons, and in her company Celestina felt great satisfaction though she had never disclosed to her any part of the sorrow that oppressed her or given the remotest hint of her attachment to willoughby all the indulgence she allowed herself was that of sometimes choosing to walk towards a knoll at the extremity of the common which afforded an extensive view towards the west from thence by the help of a telescope lent her by her landlord, Celestina had discovered a clump of firs in Alvastone Park, and although they were near ten miles distant, and without a glass appeared only a dark spot above the rest of the landscape, she found a melancholy pleasure in distinguishing them, and would frequently, as she leant on Jessie's arm, 
in their pensive rambles fix her eyes on that distant object gaze on it steadily for two or three minutes and then with a deep sigh turn away and walk silently home she encouraged however the artless jessie to talk to her of cathcart the poor girl pleased with every opportunity of repeating his name and flattered by the tender interest christina took in their story was never weary of speaking of him she at length acquired confidence enough to produce some of the letters he wrote to her and celestina who had very naturally inputted much of the praise jessie had bestowed on his writing and on his style to the fond partiality of her affection for him was surprised to find in these letters the most manly clear and sensible style she had almost ever met with the generous emulation which approved between these lovers their disinterested tenderness and the steadiness of their mutual attachment raised celestina's admiration and even respect and every hour increased her inclination to contribute to their happiness but those intentions she had no way of executing but by means of willoughby who was as she knew from long experience ever ready to befriend the unfortunate and on such an occasion she thought this, that as soon as he was married she might without any impropriety address herself to him and as the farm which old wingington the grandfather of jesse possessed adjourned to his estate at alveston celestina imagined he could hardly fail of having some influence which she knew he would be ready to exert for her unfortunate friend in mediating how to administer to the afflictions of others her own sorrows were at least mitigated but the calm she outwardly assumed was the mere effort of resolution while her anxiety to hear of willoughby and of his sister increased every hour and as the delay grew more uncountable it became almost unsupportably painful it was now the beginning of march the weather was uncommonly cold and dreary and a deep snow which had fallen some days before had confined celestina and her companion almost entirely to the house it was very unusual to see any person pass by the house near which there was no public road and the inclemency of the season rendered it still less frequent jessie therefore who went to the window by accident to fetch some work that lay there mentioned to celestina as a matter of some surprise that two foot passengers who had the appearance of gentlemen were crossing the common towards the house celestina who was at that moment meditating with her eyes fixed on the fire on the long long space of time that had elapsed since she had heard of willoughby and on all the events that might have taken place in that period gave very little attention to this intelligence and on jessie's repeating it answered that probably it was some persons who had lost their way in the snow and were coming to the house for directions to retain the ro to regain the road to jessie however the idea of cathcart was ever present one of the strangers was not unlike him in figure that she fancied though both were wrapped in great coats and the possibility of his having come to search for her had no sooner struck her than with eager eyes and a beating heart she watched every step they took at length they entered the little gate that divided the garden of the house from the common jessie was then convinced that neither of them were cathcart but her curiosity was strongly excited and listening to the questions they put to the servant who went to the door she distinctly heard one of them inquire for miss de moray celestina was now in her turn alarmed 
and trembling, though she knew not why, she desired Jessie to go down and ask who it was, but before she could be obeyed the door opened, and she saw, with emotions to which language cannot do justice, Willoughby himself. The first idea that struck her was that he was come to announce his marriage, and the air of triumph and satisfaction his countenance wore seemed to tell her he was the happy husband of Miss Fitz Hayman. Long as she had been accustomed to dwell on this idea, she shrank with terror from its supposed reality, and pale and trembling drew back as he eagerly advanced towards her. "'My heavenly girl, my own Celestina!' cried he as he took her hand. This address from the married Willoughby seemed an insult. She withdrew her hand with an air of resentment, would have spoken but could not, and unable to support herself, sat down. Willoughby, whose own anxious emotions had too much prevented his considering how she might be affected by his abrupt appearance, now saw that he had been to precipitate. He placed himself by her, and again taking the hand she had withdrawn, he inquired with more tenderness and less impetuity if she was sorry to see him. Again Celestina would have spoken, but her native pride again refused to assist her, and while she was vainly endeavouring to acquire resolution enough to congratulate him on his supposed marriage, she learnt that he had not only broken for ever with Miss Fitz Hayman, but was come to offer himself to her, who had from his childhood been the sole possessor of his affections. This sudden and unexpected happiness was too much. Her reason, which in the severest calamity had never quite deserted her, now seemed unequal to tidings so overwhelming, and for a moment or two she sat like a statue, till Willoughby, in that well-known voice and with that graceful and manly tenderness which had rendered him ever so dear to her, related all that had passed from the hour of their last parting, and the resolution he had adopted of sacrificing that wealth which could not bestow happiness to the long and incurable passion he had conceived for an object so deserving, and without whom no advantages of fortune or situation could give his life the smallest value. Tears of gratitude and affection now fell from the eyes of Celestina, and as he found the tumult of her spirits subside, he went on to relate to her, with most generous delicacy, the plans he had formed for their future life, and the means by which he hoped to retrieve his affairs, without sacrificing his happiness. Tenderly, however, as he touched on these subjects, his violated promise to his mother returned with all its force to the recollection of Celestina. Willoughby, whose eyes were fixed on hers, saw the painful idea by their expression as soon as it arose, and in a voice that trembled from emotion he could not repress, he endeavoured to obviate the objections he feared she was about to make, even before she could utter them. All his eloquence, however, could not silence that monitor in the breast of Celestina, which told her there was more of sophistry than of sound reason in his arguments. But fondly attached to him as she was, it was sophistry too enchanting for her to have courage to attempt detecting it. She wished to be convinced Willoughby was right to see him happy, had almost from her earliest recollection been the second wish of her heart, for perhaps to have the power of making him 
so had always even unknown to herself been the first that happiness seemed now to depend upon her and she determined after one of those short struggles in which when inclination and duty contend the former has too often the advantage to stissel within her own bosom every painful remembrance to think as he thought and in rendering happy the son of her benefactress to acquit herself through her future life of the debt of gratitude she owed her celestina therefore made no objection to the proposals willoughby laid before her which were that they should be married privately in about ten days and take up their abode in elveston in the same style they meant always to reside in these preliminaries being arranged willoughby besought her to permit him to introduce vavasour to her who had been waiting below he went down himself to bring up his friend and celestina in the moment of his absence endeavoured to recall her presence of mind and habituate herself to think with less agitation on the happiness of being the wife of her beloved willoughby vassiver from the ardour with which his friend had spoken of her personal perfections was prepared to find her very lovely and willoughby on their first interview watched his looks trying to discover if his expectations had been answered they were completely so the agitation she had suffered had raised the glow of her cheeks and given more softness to her eyes in which the tears yet trembled while the natural dignity of her manner received in his opinion new charms from the remains of embarrassment which she endeavoured to shake off and in which after a few moments she succeeded so well that they all became as much as their ease as if they had all been as long acquainted as willoughby and celestina jessie who had left the room on willoughby's first entrance was now desired by celestina to return during her short absence while she prepared a repast of cold meat for the hungry travellers who had walked from alvastone celestina related to them as much of her history as interested both of them in her favour and willoughby who found in every sentiment and and every action of celestina something to increase his tenderness and admiration was charmed with the generous pity she had shown to her humble friend and promised her all his influence to obtain for her the provision she had a right to expect from her grandfather and unite her to her deserving lover willoughby hung with fondness approaching to admiration on every word celestina uttered and forgot for this time the delight of seeing her must be short vassiver gay volatile and enjoying with extreme good humour the happiness of his friend was little accustomed to think at all and jessie was in too humble a situation to offer her opinion on celestina only therefore the prudence of the whole party depended as the snow was very deep and they had between eight and nine miles to alvastone she at last ventured to hint that it was time they should go to willoughby the necessity of quitting her had never occurred and he now heard of it as a sentence of banishment but celestina repeating that she should be very uneasy if in such weather they delayed so long a walk to a late hour in the evening he saw that he should make her really uncomfortable by his stay and having obtained leave to see her the next day and every day till they were to part no more he at last consented to go 
and that he and his companion might reach Alveston before the night fell. When he released the hand of Celestina, which he kissed a thousand times as he bade her adieu, she turned towards the window, and her eyes followed him across the heath till the firs and thorns at a distance concealed him from her sight. The very traces of his footsteps in the snow were dear to her, and in that frame of mind which renders it hardly conscious of its own sensations, she still gazed upon them when she could distinguish him no longer. Jessie, though she could easily account for her silence, became after some time uneasy, and speaking to her, roused her from her reverie. She then sat down in her usual place, and attempted to quiet the perturbation of her mind by reassuming her usual occupations. But the sudden transition within the last three hours from lifeless despondence to a prospect of the utmost felicity she had ever imagined was too violent to suffer her spirits to return to their usual calm. The recollection of her deceased benefactress and the fatal promise Willoughby had given her recurred in despite of her endeavours to escape from it and though resolute as he appeared to be to reconcile himself to his violation there was nobody who had power by their interference to prevent the execution of the determination he had made though nothing was likely to prevent the marriage on which he had resolved upon yet the mind of celestina remained impressed with a confused sensation rather than any distinct prospect of the happiness she had been offered and the transactions of the day appeared like a dream from which she feared by examining its reality to be awakened end of volume one chapter twelve recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Volume One, Chapter Thirteen of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith. Volume One, Chapter Thirteen. Neither the person or the mind of Celestina were of that sort which make the strongest impression on the first view, and interesting as her figure and face were, it was the grace as well as the symmetry of the former, and the expression rather than the beauty of the latter that made her altogether so enchanting. Willoughby and Vassiver were now with her every day, and while her lover found in every hour of those days more reason to congratulate himself on the choice he had made, his friend grew insensibly so interested for Celestina that, volatile and unsteady as he had been till then, he found that though considering her already as Willoughby's wife, he could form neither hopes or designs for himself yet that her happiness was the first wish of his heart and that without violating his warm friendship towards his friend he for the first time in his life envied a man who was going to be married the present happiness of willoughby could be exceeded in his idea only by that which he imagined he had secured to himself by having determined to live only for the happiness of celestina and in continually contemplating her perfections he endeavoured to justify to himself the measures he had taken 
and to dismiss from his mind the unpleasing circumstances which might have robbed him of her for ever he had written after many attempts to lord castlenorth declining to carry any farther a negotiation in which his inclinations had never any share and though he softened this mortifying information as well as he could he was sensible of the bitterness and resentment it must create and indeed was so little satisfied himself with his performance that after the fifth or sixth attempt he would have delayed or wholly have evaded sending a letter if vassiver had not with many arguments and much difficulty persuaded him that resolved as he was to break with the family any letter he could write in explanation would be less offensive than total silence celestina was very solicitous to know how he had acquitted himself towards his uncle yet as he seemed seducedly to avoid the subject she feared to give him pain by recurring to it and yielded perhaps too easily to the artifices she saw he used to draw her thoughts from it while he studying every turn of her speaking face often saw by the pensive cast it assumed uneasy thoughts arise in her mind and on those occasions exerting himself to dispel them he delighted to recall their sparkling vivacity to her eyes el lampidie del angelico riso which never bestowed greater charms on any countenance than on that of celestina it was now decided that as soon as the settlements were finished which willoughby had directed rather according to his love than to his fortune and which were likely to take up about three weeks celestina was to become mistress of alvinstone he had promised to her to forbear making about that delightful place any of the alterations he mediated till his income was so far retrieved as to allow him to do it with prudence but he had a thousand reasons ready why celestina should go there every day for to reside there entirely till she was married she had refused with such firmness as left willoughby nothing to urge with any chance of success partial as himself to this spot where she had passed the happiest hours of her life she yet in her present situation felt distressed and uneasy at the thoughts of visiting it but willoughby pressed it with so much earnestness that as the weather was now fine and she had defended herself as long as she could she at length on condition of having jessie with her agreed to go there for a whole day and that willoughby should fetch them both in his phaeton c'est le premier pas qui coûte says a french proverb he longed to have this day over knowing that the memorials of his mother which celestina would there meet with and which he feared would give her some uneasy sensations would after she was accustomed to see them lose their effect on her mind and that she would insensibly learn to behold them rather with agreeable than uneasy sentiments he persuaded himself that such a revolution had been effected in his own mind and that notwithstanding his clear recollection of certain forcible words his mother had used in their last melancholy interview he was in making himself happy doing that which if she had yet any knowledge of human events she would most warmly approve intoxicated with his passion which reason and taste seemed so entirely to justify and an extorted promise only to oppose 
Willoughby no longer suffered any uneasy recollections to cast a shade over the bright prospect opening before him. He now saw Celestina, the woman he had from his infancy adored, in the spot where his local affections were so fondly settled. Nothing seemed like to impede his passing with her there a life of uninterrupted felicity, and till their union could take place, his greatest anxiety was to, to detach her imagination from all those objections which might yet linger in her mind, and to confirm her in the persuasion that to con constitute through her future life the happiness of the son of her benefactress would be her best acquittal of those obligations she owed to her in the early part of it instead therefore of suffering her to visit immediately the particular parts of the house which she knew would be most forcibly recall ideas which might distress her he desired vassiver to attend on jessie and follow them into the garden where when they were at a little distance he related to celestina the measures he had already taken to restore or rather to introduce her amiable and injured friend to the favor of her grandfather celestina warmly approved his proceedings and gratefully acknowledged his kindness while the hope of seeing jessie rescued from the severe hardships to which she must otherwise be exposed and rewarding the disinterested attachment of her deserving lover was most grateful to her generous heart willoughby himself never seemed so perfect as when thus employing his time and his power in the service of the unhappy the fine scenery around her never appeared to such advantage as now when she leaned on one arm while with the other he pointed out to her its various beauties and at this moment the very season seemed to add something to her felicity within a few days the whole face of nature was changed the snow which had covered every object with cold uniformity had now given place to the bright verdure of infant spring the earliest trees and those in the most sheltered situations had put forth their tender buds the copses were strewn with primroses and march violets and the garden glowing with the first flowers of the year while instead of the usually rude winds of the season those gales only blew which call forth the long expecting flowers and wake the purple year myriads of birds who found food and shelter amid the shrubberies and woodwalks seemed to hail with songs their future lovely protectress hopped in her walks and gambled in her eyes and while everything was thus gay and cheerful without the house when she entered it shrewd her only contented faces the old servants its ancient and faithful inhabitants had known and loved her from her earliest childhood and rejoiced in the hope of ending their days in her service the tenants who loved their young landlord were glad to find that instead of carrying his rents to london he was coming to settle among them and the poor who had now for some time severely missed the bounty which had marked mrs willoughby's annual residence among them invoked blessings on her son from whom they were assured of more constant consideration from his own noble nature as well as from the influence of celestina who as they well remembered was formerly the successful meditrix between them and their deceased mistress when her own daughter had frequently heard their petitions with indifference or avoided them with disgust in a few days after the first visit to alvastone a fortunate circumstance occurred to facilitate the good offices willoughby had undertaken in favour of jessie woodburn 
the old female relation who had acquired unbounded influence over her grandfather died suddenly and the old man thus restored to the little power of reflection to his very advanced age left him and alarmed by the death of a person younger than himself no longer refused to listen to the remonstrances of a clergyman in the neighborhood who had by willoughby been engaged to speak to him in favor of his daughter's child he consented to see her provided no attempt was made to introduce her father to him towards whom neither time age or sickness had blunted the asperity of his hatred but though these ossidious passions retain from habitual indulgence all their inverted malignity the softer feelings of natural affection were dead in him and rather yielding to impunity than prompted by inclination he consented to receive his granddaughter to officiate about him as a servant and stipulated that during his life she should be no expense to him thus grasping to the last moment of his existence that which he had never enjoyed and could no longer want as he had nobody he valued more he consented however after many persuasions to make a will by which he gave her everything on the express condition to use his own phrase that her father might never be the better for it it was necessary though this important point was carried that jessie should by residing with him preclude the possibility of being again superseded by some of those mercenary beings who are in all ranks of life ready to surround the couch of the dying miser a necessity celestina admitted with reluctance and jessie with tears and regret but they were both consoled by the reflection that a very short time must in some degree reunite them by the removal of celestina to alvanstone which was within a walk of the farm at which her friend was now to reside willoughby having thus far succeeded for the interesting protege of celestina determined to complete his generous work by attending to the situation of cathcart he knew nothing could be more highly obliged her to contribute to whose slightest satisfaction was the supreme pleasure of her life and his own good heart prompted him to lose no time in relieving the unmerited distresses of a deserving young man he wrote therefore without communicating what he had done to cathcart enclosed him a bank-note for his expenses and informing him all that passed in regard to jessie desired that he would relinquish his place with the attorney and come down to alvanstone where willoughby meant that the same day which gave him celestina should unite cathcart to her humble friend the joy this unexpected turn of fortune gave to cathcart can better be imagined than described the sickness of the soul which long despondence and anxiety had produced vanished at once his immediate care was to secure his sister and her children's support during his absence and reserving to himself no more of willoughby's generous present than sufficed for the expenses of his journey he took a tender leave of mrs elphinstone assuring her that the first use he would make of his good fortune should be to assist her he then set out on a hired horse for alvanstone where he arrived ten days before that which was fixed upon for his patron's happiness and his own if willoughby had been greatly interested for him before he saw him he was much more so now that he found him very intelligent and well informed 
with abilities that might have made his way to any situation of life, and a heart that would have done honor to the most exalted. His knowledge, which was very extensive, was without pedantry, and his gratitude without servility. The meeting between him and Jesse, at which Willoughby contrived that Celestina should be present, was very affecting, and after the first transports of happiness so unexpected had a little subsided, Willoughby explained to them his views for the future. You, my dear Jessie, said he, must not think of leaving your grandfather, who must know nothing of your marriage while he lives, which can, according to the course of nature, be only a very little time and as you may see each other every day, this partial separation may for that little time be easily borne. As for you, Cathcart, you will stay with me. I have, in consequence of my new plan of life, many regulations to make, and many accounts to settle, in which you can be of great use to me poor beechcraft my old steward is in his eightieth year and the palsy has lately made such ravages in his intellects that he is unequal to the common business of his office while he lives however and thinks himself capable of executing his trust i am very unwilling to mortify him by taking the affairs out of his hands at his death I shall not replace him, but become my own steward, and you, my good friend, can be of the most effectual service to me in preparing everything for this arrangement, while your neighborhood to the estate of which you will probably soon become master will give you an opportunity of inspecting it and settling those plans for the future which will, I hope, believe, make you a very fortunate man. While the considerate kindness of Willoughby endeared him every hour to Celestina, and while the hearts of Cathcart and Jesse overflowed with gratitude, it would have been hardly possible for a happier party to have been anywhere found than that which now occasionally inhabited Alvastone, if the painful recollection of Willoughby's violated promise could have been entirely expelled from the con conscious recollection of Celestina, and if Vassiver had not sometimes felt towards Celestina something bordering on serious love, which was a sentiment so new to him who had never thought with respectful affection of any woman before and had passed too much of his time in scenes of fashionable debauchery that he hardly knew himself what it meant he formed however no designs for his temper was generous candid and artless so artless indeed that he took no pains to conceal what he felt almost without understanding his feelings and frequently fixed his eyes on celestina with so impassioned a look or spoke to her or of her with such unreserved marks of fondness and admiration that jesse and cathcart both saw it with some alarm but willoughby too liberal for jealousy and knowing his friend more inclined to general libertinism among the looser part of the sex than capable of a particular attachment to any woman of character sure of celestina's affection and imputing all vassiver's attentions to his admiration of beauty whenever found either notice not his manner or held him to be wholly without consequence while celestina perfectly unconscious of the power of her own charms treated him with that affectionate familiarity which his own open and lively manners encouraged and which his friendship for willoughby and the obligations they both owed to him justified 
only three days were now to intervene before that fixed for the double wedding which was to be celebrated in the parish church at alvanstone in the presence only of two trusty servants and vassiver who was to act as father to both the brides very different prospects of life from those which now were before willoughby and celestina had opened to mr and mrs molyneux who on their arrival in ireland had found sir oswald molyneux just alive he lingered unexpectedly a few weeks after their arrival and then died leaving to his son an immense fortune of which sir philip hastened to take possession and to display as soon as decency permitted his wealth and his interest while matilda now lady molyneux lost no opportunity of availing herself of the clat which almost boundless fortune gave to novelty nobody was so much followed and admired no taste was so universally adopted no parties so splendidly attended as hers and having thus attained the summit of what she fancied happiness she was in no haste to return to england till she had exhausted the felicity ireland offered her and cheerfully acquiesced in her husband's proposal of staying one summer at their magnificent seat about twenty miles from dublin in the meantime she had heard from her brother whose resentment towards her husband did not extend to her of his having broke with the castlenorths and his intentions in regard to celestina she disliked both lady castlenorth and her daughter and therefore was pleased with their mortification and disappointment she had now no pecuniary claims on her brother and heard therefore with indifference his resolution to marry a woman without fortune and as to celestina though she was incapable of any affection for her yet she thought she would make a good quiet wife for her brother and be well adapted to that insipid domestic life his turn for which she had always pitied and despised as willoughby's just resentment against sir philip had never given her any concern she gave herself no trouble to remove it and sir philip himself above all attention for the feelings of others and too much a man of the very first fashion to understand the claims of relationship or to feel those of friendship was as unconcerned as if no such resentment had ever been deserved and while they both enjoyed their newly acquired consequence in ireland willoughby was suffered to proceed on his way at alvastone without recompense and almost without notice but neither the neglect of his sister or the sullen resentment of his uncle and lady castlenorth from whom he heard nothing now gave willoughby any concern his happiness was out of their power to disturb or prevent since one day only intervened before he was to be the husband of celestina End of Volume 1, Chapter 13 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.